Okay, all right. So this is our, our last talk of this workshop. Um, and it's uh, my pleasure to introduce um, Yen, Yen's Egholm Pedersen. Did I pronounce it correctly? Beautifully. Okay, brilliant. Uh, so he's a PhD student at KTH, uh, looking at spiking neural networks and robotics. And I think the, the author of this really cool and interesting Norse software, which he's going to tell us about today. Take it away. Excellent. Thank you for the introduction, Dana. Thank you for the organizers um, for, for inviting me. Uh, I'm here to talk a bit about gradient-based learning, which I know have been touched upon a few times in this workshop. So hopefully it's relevant. It's not going to be a science talk um, uh, as such, unfortunately. So I'm not going to uh, present too much interesting science. I'd rather focus a bit on the technical part a bit, um, what, what, what Jamie was, was doing before. Um, this is joint work with Christian Peele, who talked um, a bit earlier, and and so so the base theme is basically from from the perspective of a of a spike neural network scientist working with gradient based learning. Um, and I'm actually not really here to sell NORS as a library, which is what the framework we've been developing is called. I'm I'm more here to try to port some of the success that we must conclude deep learning has been into the domain, into the realm of spike neural networks. And so um, I. I don't just think it's a matter of efficiency or of um, uh, or, or of money, so to speak. So these deep learning frameworks have been immensely successful, and so immensely funded, well funded. Um, it's also a matter of abstractions and 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 and, and a matter of 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 um, ease of working with it as a student in in my case, but also as a, as a scientist um, uh, in in the longer term. So what I'll try to do is to first motivate why we're doing this. What what's the point? Um, I'll try to talk a bit about some applications and limitations for what our software uh, is capable of doing and, and has trouble with doing. And finally, summarize and discuss some, um, some perspectives. So I should probably first dis describe what NORS is. And I'm trying to avoid um, relating it to too many other um, uh, pieces of work, even though there's been tremendously develop, uh, development in the field. Rather, I'll try to talk a bit about uh, what what we have tried to do from the realm of deep learning. And uh, we're specifically building on the, the tool called PyTorch. And if you don't know what PyTorch is, it's a deep learning accelerator that basically carries this intermediate representation, uh, computational graphs that can then port to different uh, hardware accelerators like CPUs, GPUs, TPUs, uh, and so on and so forth. What we have done is to extend PyTorch with a few um, uh, uh, differential equation describing spike dynamics. So we have basically um, exploited the entire PyTorch infrastructure to, to augment with a tiny layer of um, spiking dynamics. Uh, so NORS is, is purposefully quite a thin abstraction. And the why really pertains to the expedience I discussed before. So not just being able to run things fast, but also to be able to describe it uh, rather efficiently and to 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 discuss uh, and work with the abstraction rather uh, efficiently. I'll talk about that specifically in terms of spiking dynamics. Um, compositionality is a big term for me. I'm a, I'm a computer scientist by training, and of course, I'd like to put things together. and And I'll uh, explain how that gives us somewhat of a modularity in terms of uh, networks. Learning is, of course, a big uh, topic in this particular case, gradient-based optimization. And finally, I'll discuss some performance because it is, of course, also uh, relevant. Expedience. Um, I think pertains to the way that we can describe our, our models and not just in, in, in talking and in, in math, but also actually in code. Like the, the more correspondence we, we have between those two, the, the better in, in my opinion. So this is one example of a, um, a small activation uh, function in uh, Torch, in PyTorch. You have an import statement and describe the activation dynamic. So in this case, you have a rectified linear unit, which is not particularly inter interesting from a spiking case, but um, you can uh, subtract it or, or sorry, uh, substitute with different uh, other uh, activations. So if you wanted to have a, a hyperbolic tangent, you can do that. Um, but the, the, I think, innovation here is that those activation functions could as well exist in time. And that's what we've, we've, we've done with, with Norse. So instead of importing Torch, we now import Norse. And we simply define a leak into getting fire cell. But notice that the, the um, semantic is saying we have this computational cell that we can uh, exploit just as, uh, as well as ReLU. And of course, one would probably want to parameterize this. So this is very easy to inject uh, parameters. Here we're setting the voltage threshold to 0.8. Uh, 
uh, instead of one, which is, of course, artificial uh, constants. Um, but there's also a way to, to specify more biologically correct constants if that's uh, what we would like. So, um, of course, it's possible to exchange this dynamics. So we can have Ichikovic cells and, and other um, dynamics plug and play. And this is where I'd like to discuss a bit about modularity, because in principle, um, it's not just enough to simulate one uh, activation of a neuron. We want to, of course, build networks of it. And what you have here is a fairly simple example of a convolution network in TORT. It's very standard. It's not very inspiring. But what I want to highlight is the distinction between these convolutions and linear layers, which are actually ubiquitous compared to ANNs and SNNs, and of course the activation. So in this case, you can see the rectified linear units. And with the um, discussion we had before, we can simply just replace those activation elements and have the exact same network. Uh, and one small hook to that is that we need to describe the statefulness. So of course, the big difference between rectified linear units and spiking networks is that we have state, and we are handing this in what we call a sequential state, which is still a composition, sorry, of different spiking dynamics, but where the state is being handled. So we're taking care of the temporal dynamics to make it as easy as possible to, to model this. So that's still um, happening under the hood. In terms of learning, I need to talk a bit about how um, PyTorch is going about optimization. And I hope this is not going to be uh, too boring for many of you. I'll try to make it brief. I basically need to describe how auto differentiation works, because a big part of why this is an efficient framework to work with is because we can do auto differentiation. What that means in specific is that you can think about a network as this computational graph I mentioned before. You have basically some input that's then uh, applied um, to some operations with some parameters over time. And finally, you might get an output and some loss. Uh, I'll, I'll return to that in a second. Each of these operations are then differentiable. So what Torch does is it, it keeps track of the activation graph so that you can, uh, at a later point in time, derive the exact um, uh, uh, the, the exact dynamics with regard to some uh, uh, loss uh, and, and parameters later on. So there's a, it builds up a memory graph where you can, you can, you can backtrack, so to speak. Um, that's what Christian Peeler mentioned before, the second step of the backpropagation algorithm. You can backtrack this graph to discover the exact um, uh, effect with respect to these parameters. And the obvious question in, in the realm of spiking dynamics is, of course, discontinuities. What do you do when you have spikes? And uh, I hope I'm not offending uh, too many of you when I just mentioned one particular example of the surrogate gradient method. This is from Singer Friedman and, and Sergey Ganguly and the super spike method, which, which or super, super spike uh, gradient, which we've implemented. Uh, and of course, um, uh, Christian Peters talked from before on event-based backpropagation with uh, the adjoint method. So those things can be implemented so that you have approximations, or in the case of the adjoint method, exact gradients for spiking dynamics. And with that, I think we can claim we have differentiable neuron dynamics without going too much in, into detail there. What we still need to have, though, are uh, error estimations and derivatives of the error with respect to the parameters. So we need to actually do the calculation. Now we have the, the graph. We have to apply the actual error to, to get the derivative of, of that error. And so what I want to do very technically, just to show you briefly how this is done, it's actually quite simple. Um, um, Dylan Moore mentioned something similar on his slides, so I won't go too much in depth. But imagine you have some teaching signals, so an input-output tuple. You define your model, as we saw before. You then apply your input to the model to gain some prediction. You can then calculate the loss. In this case, you have mean squared error. Um, you then uh, uh, create this um, uh, entire uh, graph and then back propagate through it. And this is all done under the hood in PyTorch. So you can then access the gradients. What you then choose to do with the gradients is outside the scope of this talk. And uh, Dylan again mentioned um, optimizers like Adam, uh, which is an obvious approach, but there are many other interesting things to do. And that's that's really, I think the power of this approach that you can you can basically apply whatever uh, method you would want to, to, uh, to work with. Of course, this needs to be performant, especially if you train deep network. You need um, you need you need uh, you need fairly efficient um, both forward inference and training uh, passes. So what I've what we've done here is basically a benchmark between three PyTorch-based libraries. So this is Bindsnet, um, Jen, who was a um, 
presented in previous talk, and of course, uh, noise. So we've hacked together a, a quick benchmark that shows um, the simulation of um, a variable amount of neuron on the x-axis, so between 250 and 5,000 neurons. We have 32 batches, so in effect, we are simulating 32 by um, uh, 5,000 neurons um, in, in the end. On the y-axis, you have the running time in seconds. So you can see this is a 10 to the minus 1. Um, we simulate 1,000 time steps, uh, so five times for each data point. And you can see the shaded area represents the, the variance. And um, without going too much into the detail, we, we, we get uh, roughly a factor two performance for, for noise in this forward pass. Um, Gen keeps a very stable uh, performance because they've been brilliant enough to, to not use matrix multiplication, which becomes prohibitively expensive when you scale the, the, the matrix. Um, but I think this is this is this is proof that that we, we can do fairly well and and of course we've been clever in our application of PyTorch but really this is due to PyTorch having um, invested a lot of effort into just-in-time compilation and um, acceleration hardware acceleration is specifically around GPUs and 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 CUDA. So now that I've talked a bit about the theoretical or the, the idea behind noise, I want to talk a bit about some applications. I want to bring to you three applications that I have to go through a bit fast because we, are, um, we have some time constraints. I want to talk a bit about sparse computations for event-based data, memory model um, that exists in the literature, and then finally, how we can integrate this with neuromorphic hardware. So uh, this is unpublished work with uh, Philip Mondor from, from KTH. We work a lot with event-based cameras, as you see to the left. So you can imagine you, you, you record some real objects. And to the right, you can see the difference between the CIFAR um, data set, where if you want to apply this over time, you need to find a way to work with these frames, as you see in the in, in the left-right axis. Of course, the, the DVS data that we get from the event cameras is radically different. And what you see to the to the right, there is um, uh, is a part of the IBM gesture data set. Uh, and, and, and what we really have to do is to, um, to exploit this sparsity uh, to, to really gain the, the, the benefits of, of SNNs, of course. And what we have done in Norris is to actually support these bias activations. So we can actually support um, uh, inputs that have very, very uh, small fraction of, of active elements uh, throughout the, um, the, the, the simulations. And what we've done here very briefly is to simulate some Poisson rates. You see that on the x-axis, we generate some um, percentage of activation. We have roughly 1,000 lift neurons with 10,000 weighted inputs, and we simulate this over 500 time steps. Um, and what you see basically in the beginning, if you have below 10% or so activation, you get a uh, factor three or four uh, performance, thanks again to the part towards sparse activations. And this is very, very simple to implement and work with as a scientist. Again, you just simply uh, uh, apply the data assuming it's, it's sparse, like everything under the hood comes for free. So I think that's a very important point if you work with event-based data. Second, we've been um, trying to uh, uh, replicate results in, in the literature. I think this paper was mentioned before. It's uh, from Wolfgang Maas' lab of, of Julian Delek, working with learning to learn and long short-term memory. And what um, one of the tasks they mentioned in the paper is basically to learn a bit pattern over time. So you have to retain the memory of some bit pattern and reproduce it later. And briefly, the architecture is um, consists of 10 leaky integrated fire neurons and 10 uh, uh, adaptive uh, leak integrated fire neurons, so long short-term neural ne networks. And that's very, very simple to explain in, 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 in NORS. It's a model in NORS. We simply have this recurrent um, network architecture, so now we have recurrence in between these um, these neurons that model the the, the two-bit pattern uh, into, uh, into the, the population, the hidden layer um, dynamics. So three models were trained to replicate what happened in the paper. We have this 10 by 10. Uh, uh, model here, but we also had a 10, um, sorry, a 20 lift only and a 20 LSNN only to see the the, the, the comparison with, with this um, dual setup. And what we can see is that we replicate the results of the paper. Uh, well, that's hard to see here, but basically we can see that the, the, the dual approach here with these two different uh, network uh, or neuron types perform pretty well. Uh, and as expected, um, the, the, the other neuron types perform quite well because the, the dynamics are different. I think um, what this really illustrates is that we can reproduce the, the results, but also actually that there are some um, uh, dynamic dynamics to be explored here, uh, despite the fact that we are working with this tensor-based um, approach. We have a lot of other uh, deeper models available for you to, to explore if you're interested. 
Finally, I want to mention our integration with Spinnaker because, of course, we can work with spiking networking simulation. But as the previous talk um, um, uh, we're explaining, there are a lot of interesting gains to 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 find when applying this in in the real world. This is ongoing work with um, Garibaldi Garcia from uh, Sussex and that that team over there. Um, and what we've been trying to do is to take our trained model and put that onto the pneumorphic hardware platform Spinnaker. We do that via Pine. So the, the approach has been to train the model in Norse. And we do that because Spinnaker does not um, uh, implement this type of gradient-based optimization, which is, I think, normal for pneumorphic platforms. So we train it outside the pneumorphic platform. We then extract these trained parameters into a file. We generate the script um, in Pine that can then execute this trained model. So it's very much what you can call in, in computer science a transpilation approach, which is not very efficient, but it's very easy to use, um, exactly because PyTorch has these very uh, straightforward underpinning uh, representations. So what we called, uh, we dubbed the project Bifrost, um, to stay in the Nordic nomenclature. And basically what you do is first um, uh, export this model into a Python script that called smn.py, and that you can then then run. So I hope this illustrates the simplicity of the approach and the, um, uh, the expedience I discussed before. I really want to touch on some limitations in this approach. Of course, we have to suffer these deep learning idiosyncrasies. I mentioned tensors before, which is the basic yeah, building you, blocks of these. Wrap up reasonably quickly, we're running out of time. But... Yeah, of course. So another limitation is the lack of, of complex biological models. We, we, we have a lot of work to do to catch up with other uh, libraries. And finally, there's a real-time performance. Of course, you want to do this in, in real time. I'm actually just getting to the summary side, which is to say that we are basic, we, we, we're basing our work a lot on PyTorch and what they've done with the added dynamics of, of spikes. We've added quite a lot of dynamics, but I think the reason for Norse specifically is because it's very expedient to use. You can combine deep learning and spiking network research. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. There's an underlying computational graph you can then use to uh, export, and there's a host of community tooling. So the final note really here is that there are a lot of future work that's very interesting to do, specifically working on biological learning rules and better integration schemes so we can have proper support for continuous learning and continuous um, learning dynamics. Finally, I just want to say that contributions are welcome. Uh, we are licensed on the LGPL3, so it's a very open license. I have a host of people to thank, um, especially the group in Heidelberg and uh, the HPP. And um, with that, I want to thank you so much for your time, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Great, thank you very much. It's uh, it's a very cool library that I've had in mind that I want to play with for a while now, and as soon as I get some time, I'll definitely be doing that. Um, yeah, we've got a number of questions. Um, Happy to hear. The first one is from Tim Maskelia. He's asking about what the big differences are with spiking jelly. That's a very good question. So Spiking Jelly is is um, is implementing the, the custom CUDA cores uh, to get very fast performance on box lift models. So they have uh, current jumps in the, in their models, which is of course um, very fast to simulate, but not so um, so realistic. Um, otherwise, I think actually it's a very similar approach. We have a bit more neuron models uh, than, than 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 they do, and they seem to be focusing more most on the GPU performance than than we are. Okay, yeah. And people are also asking about SNN Torch and about BindsNet and various others. Um, I don't know if you want to make a, a quick comment about that or... Yeah, of course. So it's, they're very good questions and there are, there are a host of other libraries. So of course, we have to position us. I think um, SNN Torch is, is, is a fairly recent library. We started NORS, uh, the initial thoughts for this were like 2017, but the GitHub repo started in 2019. SNN Torch is newer, um, so, so uh, that, that we, we couldn't have used that. Um, BindsNet is a very interesting approach, but they don't support backpropagation. So it's very difficult to do gradient-based learning uh, with BindsNet. Okay. That's a brief answer. Yep, that's cool. No, that's perfect, I think. Uh, next question was from me. Um, do you have support for defining new neuron models? Um, support for defining new neuron models or? New new neuron models. Yeah. So like if you have to make an adaptive LIF or a... Yes, we do, and and something I I didn't. So actually, we have adaptive LIF uh, models, and we have we have quite a few um, by by now. But of course, there's a lot more to be done, and we don't expect to to have an exhaustive implementation of all the existing models. Um, so what I didn't mention is that everything here is Python, uh, right? So so even the the performance you saw was Python with a bit of magic, but but uh, all new neural models can be defined in Python. It it it, it it's very simple to approach. So definitely. Uh, we okay. everything is open on GitHub, so it's very easy to extend. And we are of course eager to um, talk with the community if you have some ideas. 
Okay. Um, so uh, Nicholas Paris is asking if you can train neuron param parameters apart from uh, weights and biases. Yes, um, and that's actually um, uh, there. There are a few notebooks we have online. I didn't mention that, but, but that shows this where you can do parameter tuning of basically arbitrary parameters. Because the only thing you need to do is to expose these parameters to this alter differentiation I discussed before. So as, as long as you can include this in the loop, you can you can basically use backpropagation to optimize it uh, as you wish. Um, I'm happy to share some links later on uh, on exactly this. Cool. OK, well, there's quite a few more questions left, but I think we're really out of time at this point, uh, five minutes over. So um, I think we'll we'll call it a day for, for that. If you want, you can answer some more of the questions uh, in the chat here. Um, happy to. If you ask questions, can, uh, can take a look. Um, with that, it's the end of the workshop. We're going to have a quick um, five-minute session just to, to say goodbye and thank all the speakers and our stuff. And we'll pull you into that in, in just one minute or so. So don't leave yet. Um, it'll be riveting, I am sure. I assure you. <laughs> and so, thank you again. Uh, thank you again, Jens. That was a great talk. <laughs>